The lips, the teeth, the tip of the tongue. The lips, the teeth, the tip of the tongue. Ready to go, Fred? Oh, yeah, I'm ready. Okay, good. Excellent. So, we're going to have a great chapter now where we get into the specifics of bonding, of how atoms actually bond together. Now, we've kind of alluded to this, and you know all about it because you've heard about bonding before, but we're going to get into the details now, and we have the tools to do so specifically for the um, transition metals, right? Because the transition metals, uh, we didn't really have a good way to know what kind of ions they would form, but now we have a better explanation for the kinds of ions that we're going to, to see from them in their ionic compounds that they form, okay? So, Let's think about, first of all, again, our favorite reaction here of sodium combining with chlorine. You remember this reaction? Yeah, I remember it. So we uh, get some sodium, put it with the chlorine gas, right? And then um, nothing happens initially, but we put a little drop of water in there. And then after a little drop of water hits the sodium, then the uh, reaction begins. And um, you see the gas, that's the green, the sodium metal, transition into this white haze, which is sodium chloride, an ionic compound, right? And from last class, we talked about this idea of ionization energy, ionization energy. Um, do you remember what ionization energy is? I can't say that I, could, I do, uh, I'm sorry. Okay, ionization energy, here's a hint. It should have been called cationization energy. Does that help at all? Uh, let's see. The energy to make it a cation? That's right. And see, that's what's going on here. Here's sodium becoming a cation, releasing an electron. And this is how much energy, all right, do you think it uh, required or releases energy to make sodium a cation? Uh, requires or releases? Uh, I don't know. How can we tell? All right, there's a couple ways we can tell. First of all, <clears throat> looking at the, the charge here, all right, might be helpful, okay? Um, if it's a positive charge, do you remember what that means? That means it requires energy. Very good. That means the process requires energy. Another way that we can remember is we talked about atoms being kind of like families, right? And if you remove an electron or a child from the family, the family is not going to like it. It's going to resist. So it's going to take a lot of energy to do that. Okay? So that's a couple ways to remember that uh, ionization energies are always uh, positive. They always require energy to, to remove an electron. How about this? The opposite of ionization energy is our electron affinity. And what does it look like here? Electron affinities require or release energy. Release energy. That's right. Is that for all atoms or just for chlorine, though? That's a good question. What do you think? Is it for all atoms or is it just for chlorine to uh, take an electron, right? Chlorine is taking an electron. Uh, I think it's just for chlorine. All right. Now, remember, we talked about uh, that kind of as a family model as well. If you have your family, the parents being the, the nucleus, and then the electrons being the kids, and you have lots of kids, right? and you're asked to take one more kid, do you think the family would take one more kid? Uh, I want to say that the family would take another kid if they're a good family. That's right, that's right, and, and, and you would be right. If you gave them another child, they would be willing to receive it. It would release energy. In other words, it doesn't require energy. The system stabilizes itself when you get one more electron. And that's true of any atom. To receive one electron, it always releases energy. It stabilizes the situation. Okay? Interesting phenomena there, but that's the case. <clears throat> so, if I take the ionization energy of sodium and the electron affinity of chlorine, right? Because that's what's happening when sodium and chlorine re react together, right? They react together, and you get <clears throat> um, a, uh, an ionic compound forming, right? These two ions then bind together. The net energy associated with that change is uh, positive 146.6. We just add these two together. Does that make sense? Yeah, I get that. Now, the question that I have, then, is 
why is this reaction exothermic? Did that reaction look exothermic to you? Did you see that reaction? Did it look like it was exothermic? Yeah, that looks like it's releasing energy. Yeah, it does, right? Let's watch the replay again. Yeah, so lots of light, and they even say they put the sand down there at the bottom so that the heat that's generated doesn't crack the glass, right? So if all that's happening is sodium is losing an electron and chlorine is gaining one, why isn't this a negative number? Well, the answer is that's not all that's happening. There's also something else that's happening, and we want to introduce what that is. The other thing that occurs is once those ions form, they come together in a three-dimensional lattice. Now, we've used the term three-dimensional lattice quite a bit. Do you think you know what that means? That's it right there, right? Oh, yes, that's it. That is a three-dimensional lattice. It's so, or so, positive ions and negative ions all combined in a lattice, three-dimensionally. That's why we call it a three-dimensional lattice where they all have many neighbors, right? Sodium and chlorine, for example, have six neighbors in which they're uh, of, of the opposite charge in which they're interacting with. Now, you can imagine if I have this three-dimensional lattice to take all the ions and separate them apart, pull them apart from each other, it would require a lot of energy, okay? Because they want to bind together, they have opposite charges. Well, in the same way that it would take a lot of energy to separate all these ions from the three-dimensional lattice, if you all of a sudden create ions, as we did in this previous chemical reaction just now, if you all of a sudden create ions <clears throat> and they can collapse into this three-dimensional lattice, a lot of energy is released, right? And we call this energy the lattice energy, all right? So all ionic compounds have a significant amount of lattice energy. And see, down here, we add on to our ionization energy of sodium and our electron affinity of chlor chlorine. We add on the lattice energy, the energy that's released when sodium and chlorine come together. And that ends up being a significant contribution to the whole. And so this is where we get our, our overall exothermic reaction. Does that make sense? Uh, can you explain it one more time? Okay, sure. So when sodium and chlorine react, right, sodium loses an electron. That releases energy, or sorry, that requires energy. Chlorine gains an electron. That releases energy. But those two steps are not enough to make the reaction happen by itself because the overall reaction just from those two contributions is still positive. Still, what do you call it when it's positive? Uh, exothermic? No. Exothermic is when it's negative, when it's pop. Endothermic. Endothermic, that's right. Good. So it's still endothermic with those two contributions. It only becomes exothermic once we have the contribution from uh, the lattice energy forming. Those ions come together and form a three-dimensional lattice. Okay, I think I got it. Yeah, all right. Now you can look at lattice energies for different compounds here. You can see lattice energies from... Compounds like aluminum oxide, right? It's really, really a lot of energy, okay? Um, and notice that these lattice energies are, are all positive values, and it doesn't really matter if they're expressed as positive values or negative values. We know that the energy is always, uh, requires energy to break the lattice up, and energy releases when the lattice forms, okay? It's always that way, and that's the same thing with, with any bond, right? If it's an ionic bond and it forms, then it's going to release energy. Anytime a bond is formed, energy is released. Anytime a bond is broken, energy is required. And that's all there is to it. No matter what you've heard anywhere else, that's always the way it is. Okay? In other contexts, when they say high energy bonds are broken and energy is released, they're leaving out the part about, they need to say instead of high energy bonds are broken and energy is released, they need to say, High energy bonds are broken, and lower, more stable energy bonds are formed, and thus energy is released, okay? Because it's not the breaking of the high energy bond that releases the energy. It's the reforming of the more stable bonds. Okay, very good. Lattice energy. 